Hello and welcome uh, to today's uh, session, uh, which is about tradition, culture, common law in South Africa. We will be uh, focusing on the challenges, development and uh, future of uh, customary law in South Africa. Thank you for taking the time out to be with us uh, this afternoon. My name is Noma Zondo. I am the Acting Executive Director of Corporate Relations. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to uh, welcome our panelists, uh, Ms. Uh, Monira uh, Osman Haider, uh, Dr. Goku Mazibuko, uh, Mr. Pumeleli Ngidi, uh, Mr. Lesala Mofokeng, as well as our um, our facilitator, Professor Sihaun Gubane, who will then introduce um, everyone um, uh, in the panel a little bit later. Uh, just to remind you as well that uh, we, are we are broadcasting live on the UKZN YouTube channel. Uh, we are experiencing a lot of uh, connectivity issues, so bear with us um, if we, you, we, we, we have issues in terms of uh, the networks and so on. So, But I hope we'll get through this uh, um, webinar without any issues. So the Bill of Rights uh, protects the rights of um, the, uh, the rights to culture, but it also protects the rights to equality and uh, non-discrimination and the rights to dignity. For a long time, uh, customary law union, uh, customary uh, unions did not have the same full legal status as civil marriages uh, had in South African law. This made uh, women in customary marriages vulnerable. This web now will then follows the, the, the passing of the, uh, of the Queen uh, Regent Mantombi, uh, Dlamini Zulu, whose passing uh, saw tensions in the Zulu royal family erupt. The late uh, King uh, good, good, uh, Goodwill, as well as his eldest wife, uh, Queen Sibongile Dlamini, laid claims to 50% of the late King's uh, estate, uh, which is worth more than uh, 71 million including the Ingonyama Trust, uh, of which the king was the sole uh, trustee, uh, claiming to be uh, entitled to... Uh, 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 queen Asbongile is claiming uh, to be uh, entitled to uh, the estate because uh, of their civil marriage. So this webinar will examine the interactions and applications of the common and uh, customary law in South Africa. But before we, uh, we, 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 we go there, I would like to take a, a, a minute or so to introduce our facilitator, uh, Usolo Azizi Haungubane, who has also been working uh, closely with the Royal Family for a while. Um, Professor Ngubane is an, um, is an academic and astute professional, uh, educator, researcher, communicator, uh, author and editor of published books and a protocol in Isizulu Royal Customs and Traditions, as well as uh, he's also a professor of Isizulu uh, language, uh, literature and culture at the University of KwaZulu Natal. And he is also one of the most uh, senior and accomplished, is, uh, accomplished Isizulu linguists in the country. Again, I would like to welcome all of you and thank you for, for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. I trust that you'll find uh, the session fascinating and engaging. Uh, Solwazi, I would like to hand over to you uh, so that you can also introduce our, our guest, the, the panelists, and then we can uh, proceed with the, with the session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Noma Zondo, our Acting Executive Director, Corporate Relations, for introducing the webinar today. I'll just make a few comments and then I will then uh, let the panelists uh, take the floor. The webinar critically investigates challenges in the recognition of customary law in relation to tradition and culture in democratic South Africa. In my paper published in 2019 in the International Journal of Law and Society, I identified indirect colonial rule as an impediment to the recognition of indigenous authority in South Africa. Indigenous Africans 
have observed customary law from time immemorial in the pre-colonial era to govern their own people with success before the establishment of British colonial policies. Indirect rule treated indigenous tribal chiefs as political intermediaries, which has caused an imbalance of the application of law. This policy was used as a mechanism from which apartheid emerged in the 20th century and changed the African political identity landscape to favor imperialist ideology at the expense of the African cosmology. Our constitution makes provision to create a cultural diverse society by granting its citizens the rights to culture, language, and the pursuit of individual rights based on tradition and African religious beliefs. The provision emerges from the premise of the Bill of Rights, which we consider as the most progressive law globally. Here we are after 27 years of democracy, still at crossroads when it comes to a truly multicultural society. Customary law is the only lens that we can use to assess our success in how far we have come. For the purpose of today's discussion, it is appropriate for me to mention that customary law refers to the customs and usages traditionally observed by indigenous African people of South Africa and which form part of the culture. Culture is the way of life reflected in a person's behavior, traditions and habits, which connect that particular individual to the community he belongs to. The Constitution of South Africa affords official recognition to customary law as well as to the institution, status, and role of traditional leadership. Uh, the, the, the mandate of the courts to, it gives the mandate to courts to apply African customary law where applicable. It also protected the, by the Bill of Rights under uh, the right to freedom, belief, and opinion. The Bill of Rights further provides an individual the right of language and culture, as well as the collective right pertaining to cultural, religious, and linguistic communities. To this end, Western cultures is powerful and the ultimate rule in South Africa. Take language as an example of this. English is used for law and judgment are passed in English from our courts. This was a common practice before, and it's still uh, the, the, the practice even in our democratic dispensation. Customary Marriage Act stipulate that marriages can only be terminated by Western court of law and not in the tribal courts. It is obvious that South African common law still form basis of the modern South Africa and as a binding authority in the constitutional court. Conditions of the judicial application of customary law during the apartheid era led to the question of legitimacy or indirect rule in the new democratic society. Today, we explore challenges faced by traditional practices in the dispensation of justice and the infusion of customary law into the general framework of the law in the judicial practice. Is there any potential alignment in the application of customary law with common law in our courts to mark the democratic dispensation in the post-colonial era? That's a question. The second question, is there any hope for equal cultures in South Africa? Have we succeeded in navigating the ideas of cultural diversity and practices? Today, our panelists will further elaborate on the subject of traditional practices and how it impacts on the justice system in South Africa. They will deliberate on the challenges, development and future of the customary law in the promotion of a multicultural society in South Africa. So 
Ladies and gentlemen, without much further ado, I will now introduce the first uh, uh, panelist to make a presentation. And I will request that they present for 15 minutes. And then after that, I will introduce the next speaker. When our panelists have finished presentation, we'll then open the question and answer uh, session where people will write under Q&A their questions and then I will alert the panelists to respond to those questions. I hope you will enjoy the presentation. The first uh, uh, panelist is Ms. Munira Osman Haider, who's a lecturer in the School of Law, College of Law and Management Studies. I won't go on with the introductions because they are included in the program. The topic is polygamous Muslim marriages in South Africa. I hand it over to you now, uh, Munira, to address us. Thank you, uh, Professor Nkobani, and thank you for the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to share with you some thoughts on uh, polygynous Muslim marriages in South Africa. Now, of course, uh, the first thing that would probably strike everybody around this topic is, well, really, how does it fit into uh, the actual topic that we're dealing with today, which is basically that uh, we're looking at tradition, culture, and common law in South Africa, and uh, we're looking at the challenges, developments, and future of customary law um, in South Africa. So, I want to basically uh, start off then by contextualizing uh, my topic within the broader topic that we're discussing um, today. So firstly, if we look at the law of common in South Africa, that's basically a reference to unwritten law, laws that have been developed uh, by the courts, principles that have been developed and now become uh, legal principles that we follow. And a lot of uh, the common law principles that have been developed around uh, Muslim marriages, its consequences, it has not been recognized through any kind of statute, nor validly recognized through common law, but it does form uh, part of common law in those few principles that I have, have been developed and which I will um, touch on uh, later. And then secondly, we see this term customary law and when we understand customary law generally in South Africa, we normally uh, think of customary law as um, African customary law. But a broader understanding of customary law is basically uh, an acceptance of customs that have over a period of time through its nature of being a, a characteristic of law has become some kind of legal principle which a particular community follows. And if we look then at uh, the marriage laws in South Africa, especially uh, marriage law, it can be said uh, we can actually uh, basically call that uh, Muslim customary law or Islamic customary law. Um, it, it, it really doesn't matter, but what I'm trying to say here is that I'm trying to contextualize this whole topic of polygynous Muslim marriages within uh, this broader topic. And what I want to then kick off with uh, is basically that <clears throat> we would have to understand the concept of polygyny as it applies in terms of Sharia or as it exists in terms of Sharia. And the starting point for all of this is the sources. And when we look at the source, the primary source is the Quran and a specific verse which is speaking to the idea of polygyny is in um, Surah 4 verse three or chapter four verse three. And I will quickly uh, go through that for you. If you cannot act fairly towards the orphans, then marry the woman you like, two or three or four, but if you fear that you will not be able to be fair, then one or what you already have, okay? And that makes it more likely that you avoid bias. Now, this particular verse forms the basis of the concept of polygyny and how it operates under Islamic law. 
So if we have to break up or unpack this particular verse, then firstly, it's the permission for polygyny. However, it's not unlimited polygyny. And of course, let me just uh, quickly uh, clarify what I mean by polygyny. It is where the husband in a marriage is allowed to take on more than one wife. So it's permission for polygyny and it is limited to four. And then of course, we see that when we look at the beginning of the verse, it's actually uh, some kind of reference to orphans. And that's basically giving us some context when this verse was revealed, which I will also deal with just now, which is the next point. And that preceding verse, which is then leading on um, to, to verse three, <clears throat> is, and give the orphans their properties and do not substitute the bad for the good. Do not consume their properties by combining their manures, for that would be a serious sin. Now, of course, then, if we're looking at the context of when and how this particular verse was revealed, it was at the time when um, there were many wars being waged. And as you know, that the result and the uh, uh, consequences of war is that there are many orphans and widows <clears throat> that are left behind who need to be taken care of and who need to be protected. And so this verse came down within that particular um, context. So what exactly are the implications then of uh, this verse in terms of understanding the practice of polygyny uh, under Islamic law? So firstly, we note that justice must be done to orphans. And I just want to say very, very quickly here that the term orphans, when it's used uh, in terms of the Arabic word, which is yatim, it is not generally how we understand orphans to be children who do not have either parents. In the Arabic context, it's referring to a child who does not have a father. So that is why we're seeing this word orphans, and that's the, uh, the manner in which it is being used. So justice must be done to the orphans, and we're referring here to the orphans who are as a consequence of the wars that were fought. And then you look at this verse, it's another thing that it's telling us is that if a Muslim man cannot do this selflessly, that means he cannot uh, 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 you know, engage with doing justice to the orphans, uh, then and only then should he marry the woman so that he will be able to then do that kind of justice. But again, it is limited um, uh, to um, four. And of course, when we look at it then, we're seeing that in the context, polygyny, is there, it's the permission is there in order to safeguard the rights of the orphans and the widows. Um, so there has to be a relationship between the man and the woman uh, in terms of actually uh, the man will then marry uh, this particular woman because marrying the woman is able to give the woman protection and able to give the orphan the protection. And of course, what we're looking at is financial protection to a large extent and the fact that uh, to provide some kind of uh, um, fatherly guidance for the children. So lots of scholars then are arguing that actually to do, orf to do justice to the orphans is actually a prerequisite. And you'll see that in some uh, Islamic jurisdictions, there has to be a reason before a husband can actually engage um, in polygyny. So, Doing justice to the orphans is mandatory because that is what the verse is saying. And so also is doing justice um, uh, to the women, basically the ones uh, who are widowed, whom a Muslim man will marry. And then comes the part that is really sort of the controversy of a lot of this verse is, and if he cannot do justice to all his wives, he must only have one wife. And on that note, then there's also debate amongst the scholars about uh, if you look at this particular verse, is the rule monogamy and the ex exception polygyny, or is the rule polygyny and the exception monogamy? Because um, some or scholars are saying, if you look at the verse and marry two, three, or four, because that comes right at the beginning, that in fact, that is the rule and the exception is monogamy. While others are arguing that, um, the exception comes up first, and in fact, the rule is monogamy. And why these scholars are arguing that the rule is monogamy is because uh, 
it says there that if you cannot do the justice, and lots of the scholars in this sense argue that that justice is almost impossible. And very, very clearly what is meant by this term justice, some argue that it is just two things. Um, and if I might put it crudely, it's uh, time and money. So when you have more than one wife, you uh, have an obligation as the husband to spend equal time with each of the wives. And financially, you have to take care of them equally. Um, if you look further down in the same chapter, verse 29, 129, sorry, it sort of qualifies this whole concept of justice. And it says something to the effect that, in fact, it is not humanly possible uh, to actually uh, do justice. And of course, that particular justice that is being referred to, scholars are arguing that it is, in fact, emotional justice. And so even as parents, sometimes, uh, you know, it is very, very difficult to love every child equally or equitably or whatever other term you wish to use. So sometimes you like uh, your eldest a little bit more or you like the youngest one a little bit more and so too in the arena of more than one wife, there will be a favorite wife or a less favorable wife, et cetera. Uh, however, that may not always uh, be fair under all uh, conditions. And then of course, um, just the, the sort of last point I want to make here is that while polygyny is permitted, if we take it strictly as it appears uh, from the sources, that there are strict conditions. And of course, we also understand that if there are strict conditions, then there is a lot of room within which to actually regulate uh, these conditions. So in keeping with the mandate of the topic, then I'm going to look at what are some of the uh, sort of um, challenges. But before I go to that, I think we must understand uh, what are some of the justifications or the reasons that uh, this whole concept of polygyny has actually been permitted within the Islamic framework. So uh, men are allowed to take on another wife if there is infertility or some kind of long-term illness um, of the first wife. Uh, and um, some people think that this becomes their right because they are wealthy and have enough wealth that they think it's fine to have more women as wives and that works positively as well if they were marrying widows in order to support uh, widows and divorced uh, women and divorced mothers, et cetera. But this seems to be the theoretical aspect of the justification. When you look at the challenges, we see that, in fact, the practice uh, is not in keeping with uh, this noble sort of uh, justification. And then if you look at the context where polygyny originated, uh, in Islamic law, uh, in its very early sort of stages, it was used as a very, very useful socioeconomic purpose. And that was in absorbing the surplus women who were now left widowed. And of course, uh, in terms of uh, taking care of the many orphans. Um, if we look at the various different countries that are following Islamic law or have some kind of a code on Islamic law, etc., they have adopted some kind of response to the concept of polygyny. So while some have actually uh, taken it as uh, being permitted and therefore it should be regulated and looking at the regulations so of Pakistan, for example, uh, regulates polygyny. So it allows it, it regulates it. Uh, if we look at Iran, Iran uh, regulates it, but Iran, the husband must show reason why he wants to take on another wife. And then if you look at Tunisia, it has abolished polygyny altogether, right? So you see how the different countries are actually uh, responding to this concept uh, in terms of what is best suited for their own local setting. And so the same is going to happen then um, in South Africa. Now, if we look then at what are some of the challenges that this particular concept poses for South African Muslims, then of course, very early on in our history, our greatest challenge was the state response to polygyny. Uh, there was moral disapproval of polygyny. It was regarded as contra, uh, contra bonus mores, which is basically it was against uh, public morality. And 
there was this label that was given to all Muslim marriages that uh, they were classified as potentially polygynous. Although if you looked at, if you look even currently at the Muslim community, uh, the statistics show that only about 2% of the Muslim community are actually engaged in polygynous marriages. But based on that, um, the early history shows that in fact, all Muslim marriages were regarded as potentially polygynous. And just in terms of what are some of the social challenges uh, that the community is facing with regard to this. And I've, I've sort of looked at it from, firstly, from the position uh, of the first wife. And they all differ. So it's not every first wife that will experience all of these challenges. Some of them do. Some first wives don't experience any of these challenges. And so too with the second wives. But anyway, so lots of the times, uh, first wives seem to be neglected, either in terms of finance or either in terms of time, whatever uh, that case might be, or uh, that the husband just loses uh, any kind of affection for the first wife and gives all his affection and emotion to the subsequent wives. Um, of course, then, if you look, if you're still looking further down, some, some first wives are actually unaware that their husbands have other wives. And that's because they've uh, entered into these marriages secretly without informing uh, their first wives. In some instances, first wives have all the protection of the marriage to the exclusion of the subsequent wives. And that's very, very often the case where the first wife is also registered to the husband in terms of the marriage laws of South Africa, which is in terms of the Marriage Act. But generally, the first wife doesn't really seem to have too much uh, of, of a challenge uh, because when you think about the broader family setting, then the in-laws are more partial generally to the first wife. And that brings me then to what are some of the challenges uh, that subsequent or second wives experience? Uh, well, like I mentioned earlier on, they are hidden. Um, it's not something that's public because the husband hasn't told the first wife that in fact, uh, he has a other wife or a second wife or whatever the case might be. So they are secret marriages. So this second wife is very vulnerable for many different reasons. Uh, she could be financially vulnerable. She does not have enough time to spend uh, with the husband. She is not allowed to uh, intermingle with the husband's family. So all of these restrictions, all because this particular marriage um, is a secret marriage, as we say. Munira, then, course, Munira, we are out of time now. Can you just wrap up? Okay. All right. I'll try to go quickly to... So those, those are all the challenges. And then there's been many developments. So we need to look at them and then I'll go quickly to um, the future. So remember the constitution and the embracing of a democracy brought about the Bill of Rights, which guarantees freedom of religion. And so we start to see a change in the court's approach uh, to Muslim uh, marriages. And we're starting to see uh, a lot of the common law principles that I spoke about earlier being developed. And then simultaneously, there was this whole process of um, coming up with a legislative framework that would recognize Muslim marriages and then also would give some kind of recognition to polygynous Muslim marriages. That bill has not uh, reached parliament and that particular bill, the whole process has now been shelved in, uh, in the face of what is happening currently, which is basically the single marriage statute process and the uh, very recently published uh, green paper on marriages in South Africa. And while the Muslim marriages process was really not, uh, the, 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 the legislative process was really not taking on as it should be. We had court cases coming before the court, going right up to the Supreme Court of Appeal, uh, the court uh, basically looking at the question of why government has not as yet passed some kind of legislation that would recognize Muslim marriages and therefore recognize a polygyny. And the last we had, uh, the ruling by the Supreme Court of Appeal, which basically said that uh, not to recognize Muslim marriages was unconstitutional. 
and declared uh, the Marriage Act and parts of the Divorce Act, etc., unconstitutional and gave temporary relief. Uh, currently, what we have in terms of recognizing um, polygyny is the single marriage statute, which is being driven by the Department of Home Affairs. And it's an attempt to recognize all marriages and protected relationships in South Africa under one piece of legislation. Uh, a big debate around polygyny in those two bills that are actually being uh, uh, proposed at the moment. The one is around consent, which is basically that the existing wife or wives must give consent for subsequent wives. And the other issue is that where this consent has not been obtained, then that marriage would be rendered void. And that is uh, quite uh, an issue that needs to be looked at. And of course, there's the green paper, uh, which uh, if we look at it, seems to favor a very broader idea of polygamy and lot, lots of different issues in the green paper are regarded as highly uh, contentious. It is raising various different concepts around polygyny, which is polyandry, polyamory, and uh, quite a few other issues. Uh, so if we're looking at the future of polygyny and polygyny as practiced by the Muslim community, then uh, there is space for it in terms of the-, the I'm, I'm afraid are... I'll have to stop you now because we were above even 20 minutes and we're expected to finish in 15 minutes. So okay, that we thank are- Thank you. To, to speak. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to cut you like this. Uh, this is a very interesting subject that is of interest to, uh, African men as well, that this is justified, polygamy is justified by your Quran. And there are some commonalities that I've observed, like that the consent of from the first wife is necessary, just like in the Zulu culture, we also observe that. And I like that there is no equity in the treatment of the wives. So there, there's a lot uh, of commonalities uh, amongst the African people themselves. Uh, but what was very interesting is that there is a limitation of four wives and still it allows opportunity for secret wives beyond the four, fourth wife. Thank you very much uh, for such a uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation. Colleagues, uh, without much uh, further ado, I will now Go straight to Dr. Kuku Mazibugo, who's a senior lecturer in the School of Arts, African Languages, College of Humanities. Uh, her presentation is on Umkako, which is a Zulu wedding, and it links immediately from the, the previous uh, pre presentation. We he, she's going to take us through the processes and the significance of the rituals uh, within the Zulu wedding. Uh, and the essence of Umkato in the Zulu uh, perspective is that you never go back home. Once you, you go forward, you never look back. Welcome, Jen. Welcome, uh, Dr. Mazibu. The floor is yours. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Warm greetings uh, to you all. Um, the first uh, presentation uh, has been an eye-opener on how diversity has to be factored into all future best uh, practices. Uh, because of network uh, challenges, I will switch on my video. Uh, thank you. Um, my top, my topic is um, Umtato Wesi Zulu, which is a Zulu wedding. Um, uh, just a brief outline uh, of the presentation uh, on on Umtato Wesi Zulu, which is a a Zulu 
wedding, I will, I will look at uh, the various uh, stages and celebrations uh, uh, preceding uh, the actual umtato, uh, which is courtship, utu, ilobolo, umkeso, uptimela, umtato, and then I conclude. Uh, I just want to, to, to highlight that um, um, it's important um, to note that, uh, as the chair has already alluded to, to it, that uh, there are various um, uh, celebrations and also uh, there, are, there are various stages prior to the, the, the wedding and after the wedding. Um, my topic uh, is to provide just a short informative outline of a Zulu wedding, therefore a marriage as rooted in its tradition and context. For me, referring to it as a common law marriage places it and benchmarks it according to standards of international law that is also rooted in foreign cultures and this presentation seeks to demonstrate and validate how marriage in the Zulu tradition is not an individual affair, but talks to the heart of clans, communities, and thus the whole Zulu nation and its good uh, citizens. A traditional Zulu wedding is the one that is celebrated having fulfilled all the rituals, customs, and traditions that form an integral part of that union. Above all, traditional weddings are sacred ceremonies, the basis for family, community, and nation. Uh, where it, it, it began, courtship. This plays an integral part in preparation for umtato. And this is where all relationships commence. It, is, it used to be a protracted process that allows a young woman to select the right future husband amongst many hopeful suitors. And then this is followed by uh, the, the giving of Utu, which is a special beadwork uh, that is given uh, to the husband to be. This is a, a public celebration for both young men and a young girl uh, confirming their love. Uh, well, it could be for a man because when a man is taking another wife, uh, he could not be a young man, but it could be for a man and a, a, a young girl or a woman confirming their love a, a maiden crowns men with lovely beadwork as a sign of acceptance of his love. And after the ceremony, the, 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 the girlfriend, or call it the woman, accompanied by her peers, they visit the boyfriend's family, taking traditionally acceptable goodies to see the homestead that is to be her future home. Uh, this is called a uh, that, 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 that small um, visit is uh, uh, umbondo. And then the lobolo follows. Um, well, according to the Recognition of Customary Marriages Acts 120 of 1998, lobolo is the property in cash or in kind which a prospective husband or head of his family undertakes um, to give to the head of the prospective wife's family in consideration of a customary marriage. Uh, the main aim of Ilobolo is to join both families together and to strengthen the relations, uh, not uh, uh, as it is commercialized, but the main aim is to uh, join the both families and, and strengthen the relations. Uh, Ilobolo binds the two, and it is an important uh, relational uh, tie. Sending of Ilobolo is followed by sending of uh, Umbondo, which is uh, 
another giving of uh, food, uh, traditional beer uh, to the husband's, uh, future husband's family, uh, thanking uh, for paying Lobola, and also to seal a, a seal to the agreement uh, to being relatives for life. And this is followed by uh, another ceremony called Umkelo, uh, where the groom's family pays an arranged visit uh, the bride's family to dress the bride according to the manner in which her future family will expect her to dress. In this ceremony, a cow is slaughtered and the bride is sprinkled uh, with bile on this day. Uh, and please know that each time there's a ceremony, there is a bile that is sprinkled as a form of sealing, uh, strengthening the relationships. Uh, this umkelo is equivalent to the modern uh, engagement party and gives in the form, um, various gifts are given to the bride's family. Uh, and uh, one um, other item that is the modern version of uh, umkelo is called umembeso, uh, which is a, a bit modernized. Um, and then when all this has been done, then is the actual uh, umtato, the wedding. Uh, this uh, is preceded by umnamo, which is a ceremony for bidding farewell to the bride-to-be. Uh, two cows or more are slaughtered from both families and there's exchange of some meat uh, to join both families. And the bride is sprinkled with bile to deregister her from her maternal home. And then she is, led, she is led by hand by her father or the elder in the, in the family uh, to the cattle crawl and then to the gate. And the bridal entourage departs at dawn to arrive in the early hours uh, in the new home. I hope we, we have witnessed that uh, when the, 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 the new king was, uh, was sending the Lobola negotiators uh, to, her, to her queen. Uh, we, have, we have witnessed that they arrived uh, at night. Then the, the, the bride is then introduced to the family in front of everyone. Uh, it's not a secret. Singing and dancing follows. Competing parties from both uh, parties uh, perform in traditional attire and sing songs relevant to each on this day. The elderly from the bride family confirm that the husband has met all the Lobola requisites, tabulate all received and go on to give a transparent account on the state of health of the bride as is expected. And the elders from the husband's family then recite the family praise poems in acceptance of the bride and introduction to her a new family. Then the most important part is the local Inkosi representative who is officiating at the ceremony uh, will then publicly ask the bride three times whether she takes the groom to be her husband. Uh, the bride will then give the Inkosi re representative a grass mat as a sign of validating her commitment to her husband and sing her own uh, Inkondlo or song which she composed herself and dance in front of her husband, rejoicing and showing him that she is happy to be his wife. The husband then join her in dancing, which means that these people they have made an agreement. All these proceedings confirm that she is not forced into this marriage. The husband's family then welcomes the bride to the family by sprinkling her 
with Bile one more time to register her as a new family member. These rituals and undertakings therefore preclude any form of divorce in Zulu traditional weddings. Therefore, that uh, wedding can be registered uh, and uh, it is official. The concept of marriage in Zulu culture, it is not an agreement between two individuals that can be dissolved at any whim. It is a contract for life between the two families. Modern times have seen the commercialization of Lobola at the expense of its true role and meaning, as much as it is neither ever paid by the groom alone, nor all at once, but by his whole family. So it is never a single person's bounty in the bride's family either. It cements relations between the two families. Lobola and the subsequent exchanges of meat, gifts, goodies are an expression of a cemented lifelong relationship. In conclusion, from all the above said, let me reiterate that there is definitely a need to trace the challenges, developments and future of customary laws in South Africa and ways found as a matter of agency on how this can be mitigated from a point of view of the lived experiences of the concerned people and not as convenient expedient or expedient solutions that meets aspired international standards at the expense of national identity and culture that makes a people. Gia Bonga, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for such a wonderful presentation. And I also commend you for sticking to time limit. It's uh, two minutes before your time ends, but thank you very much. I think I must um, uh, commend you for explaining the, the processes and the rituals of Umtato and the fact that it is not a contract between two people, but it is bringing two families together. And I also liked the the, the Utu part of your presentation. Utu is a, is a Zulu term which can be translated as a love letter. When you give out Utu, it's once in a lifetime. You cannot uh, give out Utu to more than two people. It's only for only one person. I think uh, people will want to question you more during the question and answer. And thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Mazubu. Let me now invite uh, Ubaba Ushomuga Mpumele Lingiti. Uh, Mpumele Lingiti is a lecturer School of Social Sciences in the Department of History, College of Humanities. And the topic that he's going to uh, deliberate on this afternoon is polygamy in the Zulu kingdom during the reign of King Tejwai and King Dinizu. Welcome, Shomuga, uh, and the floor is yours. All the best. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Ngyabonga, Baba, Babu Ngobane, so much. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just talk about the uh, due to time limits, I'll try to be quick. Uh, the 19th century marked the turning point in the history of Guazulu, uh, with Natal becoming the colony of British administration in 1843, after a, bri a brief Republic of Natala by the Fortrekas. This posed a serious threat to the Kingdom of Amazulu and the prospect of war was inevitable. The British motive of distrusting the Zulu kingdom will later be realized under the leadership of Isidu Sasondini, which in Indomiyama, King Tejuayo, in July 1979, thus becoming the last independent king of the Zulus, and his son, Umamonga Osutu, King Dinuzuli, becoming the first king of the dependent Zulus. 
because of time, I will not uh, dwell much uh, on the history of their uh, of their of, of their periods. Uh, with the with, with the recent falling of kings Odisinga Peguzulu and Queen Manfombi, uh, there has been a reignited um, history of the Zulu Kingdom. It is the passing of the queen that has also raised the, the role of women uh, in the kingdom. Speculation has been rife uh, regarding on who should take over the throne, thus taking the issue of his temple into the into the spotlight. King Tinizulu, born 1868, ascended the throne uh, of the Zulu Kingdom between 20 May 1884 and uh, 18 October 1913. He became the king at the uh, early age of 16, and his mother was uh, Nom Vimvi and Zimela, better known as Kamsweli. There has been uh, confusion among people confusing uh, the queen as uh, of Mswedi's same name. Uh, to clear this up, um, Sweli uh, was his father. His same name was Mzimela, who ironically uh, fought for Muya's West uh, Izikosa against King Tejwayo's Usuto in the battle of Ndondagosoga in 1856, between Tejayo and his brother, uh, Prince Mbuyazo, in the Venice uh, Nevertheless, Nswedi's daughter became Tejayo's wife, uh, who gave birth to the next king, uh, who, who became the king of Amazulu at a mere age of 16, because he was the only son of King uh, Tejayo. Come Swedi, together with the uh, traditional prime minister of the time, Mankuluman and Duando, secured the throne, for King Dinu Zulu, and the British administration wanted uh, to arrest the king, especially after the 1906 Bambasa Rebellion. Whenever there was war, Kamsweli would arm herself and wear his late husband king, the Joyos Imfunulu. She would arm herself. She had her Ibuto, she had her Ibuto called Imbogote Both. It was through Kamsweli's resistance that the people observed that Watinta Kamsweli was in Imbogote Both. To this day, we have this. Uh, it's, it's, it's what's it in Bogoto, what's in Tabafaz. It comes from there. Uh, there. Um, unfortunately, I can't share here, uh, but I'll avail it later on. There were, there were, or there are a number of reasons which made it more possible for men to have more than one wife during or before the era in question. There were no exor exorbitant expenses for paying Loboda. Most men had uh, uh, carefully and uh, grazing land and subsistence farming was the order of the day and there were resources for maintaining a living. Carefully was the wealth of the time. There was no poverty in many cases. There was, has, uh, however, unprecedented uh, famine uh, or rather hunger or injured in Guazul in the early uh, 1850s. This was called Ujutule. The other reason was that the second half of the 19th century coincided with the Natal becoming the colon of Natal, an imminent, imminent destruction of the Zulu kingdom. This was the turning point and the challenge to Amazon. Men were, were dying in war, some were dying at a very young age. Hence, there were many women than men. Another reason would involve wealth. Some men had, in Mishambi as in Como, they had thousands of cattle. This afforded them to pay as much love order as they can. So they would marry uh, as many wives as, the, as, as they could. In some cases, um, some men were loved by women. Some men were good, uh, were good looking than others. It, it is also the case to this day. An example would be uh, King Senza Kola Rajama, who had more than 15 wives. Another example would be Inkosi Yagabuteles Mnyamani, who had 50 wives, uh, while his half brother, Unkwana uh, Kakoboye Nagambulane, had 80 wives. Some were loved by women not because they had wealth, uh, but Babenokas, they were just being loved, some men. Uh, this also happened to this day. You will find someone with many girlfriends, and you would even ask, what are they doing? Or what, are, what do they see on this one? Women, uh, women also encourage polygamy in some sense. When observing that she is getting old and cannot perform some of the duties, she will pick a younger woman to marry her husband uh, as her assistant. This will be called in a retirement house because the subsequent wife 
was not built uh, uh, her own house, but why is Ongena Gule Ekon was being installed in the existing house. Despite uh, house duties, men in the past uh, were very, I'm talking about the, the, the 19th century here. Men in the past were very strong because of the food they ate and uh, they took care of their uh, uh, sexual stamina. A man would be sexually active and still produce babies till the, day, the last day of his death, of his, uh, uh, the last day of, uh, on, on earth. A polygamous man uh, had his own apartment uh, in most cases, if I can call it. And he would call women, uh, the women in, the, in, in his police, uh, 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 marriage uh, into this particular uh, apartment. Uh, for the night. He did not go to their uh, places of sleeping. In some instances, when a man cannot impregnate uh, his wife's or wife, he would request his brother, Uguba Ayago Varashele Lawini. He would request his brother to his brother to visit uh, his bedroom so that his brother can impregnate his wife. The children would customarily uh, belong to the one who's infected. The man who's infected. This is practiced in order to continue the family lineage. An example to this would be the sons of King Nyaman of the Butelese clan. Chanimbezo Nyamana was infertile, hence he requested his uh, brother Mkandu Mbagamyamana to do it for him. Uh, polygamy is and was not uh, compulsory, but it was expected that a man should apply polygamy for a number of reasons. The homestead uh, of a Zulu family in Uluma was large and not, easy, uh, not an easy task for one wife to manage. There were too many rituals and customs, including in Sebenzi, uh, uh, ceremonies in the Zulu family, uh, which, will be, which will be impossible uh, to be performed by a few, uh, a few or one wife. There will be a brewing of traditional beer and also uh, uh, cooking and many other festivities we need, which needed many hands to complete. A man needed to have many children and many wives uh, to complete uh, these family rituals. A few, was, uh, a few wives uh, stood the possibility of not giving a bed to, uh, to sons who would continue with the family lineage. An example would be King Jama, uh, Kandaba, whom it is not reported that he had many wives. He only got a center corner through Queen uh, um, Tania. And um, there, were, there, were, uh, there were others, but uh, he wanted in Jalifa, of which he got uh, the, his in Jalifa center corner, Selim uh, Shone Langa, as he was uh, old. There was a necessity for people to bear. Another reason is another reason is that there was a necessity for people to bear many children, uh, for for war's sake, uh, because the, 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 in the times of war, people have to 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 have as many children as possible so that uh, the nation or the family can be ready uh, for to fight uh, enemies. And also, men respected uh, women in some sense. Uh, one will not break uh, uh, someone's uh, virginity and not marry them. It's, that was very uncommon. Uh, the topic of his team can go on for days and, and, uh, and needs time for, or, or on, on its own. Uh, but due to time constraints, I would like to just end this day. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for explaining uh, the process of um, polygamy. And I think what what I want to is uh, the observation of the concern that is afforded by the first wife to the other wives. In the case of uh, a, a king having fifty wives. Did these wives have equal equal rights as as the wives of King Jam? So that that's also something for the next uh, webinar to to discuss and unpack. Thank you very much for the insightful presentation.
Shomuka. Uh, the next uh, panelist is Mr. Lisala Mfukeng. Uh, Mr. Mfukeng is a senior lecturer in the School of Law, College of Law and Management. And today he is going to unpack the topic, propriety consequence, consequences of polygamous customary marriage. So he is bringing in the legislation perspective of these marriages. Uh, Baba Mfukeng, over to you. Okay, th thank you, uh, Professor Ngubani, and thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to, to speak on this topic. It's, it's a very interesting topic, and uh, I wish there could have been more time uh, to really deal with the issues uh, that uh, the previous speakers have highlighted, and which I'm going to continue to highlight uh, during my presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, the topic is on the propriety consequences of a customary marriage, in particular, a polygamous customary marriage. Um, that um, topic could have been more in terms of content, but I'm going to actually just give you a summary. And the other thing that I'm going to do is just to show you, I like showing a little bit of picture so that people can imagine things that perhaps they would not understand better if they don't see any picture of that. But I'll come to that in a moment. Just a little bit of background and context. Um, what we need to understand about customary marriages is that um, at some point in history, um, the only law relating to marriages in South Africa was customary law. The problem came when um, South Africa was actually colonized, but I won't go back to, to that history. I will just start in 1927, what happened when the, the Black Administration Act was passed. And that act was uh, supposed to regulate all affairs of African people, including marriage. Now, this is where the concept of public policy was actually introduced into marriage because, because in terms of that law, any customary law that was considered to be immoral uh, was supposed to be struck down by the courts and not enforced. So one of those laws was in relation to marriage. So in, from 1927, you'll find a lot of issues there, but um, for the sake of time, I need to indicate that during that period until 1999, there was no full recognition of customary marriages. Um, the legislation at the time recognized um, on an ad hoc basis, um, this customary marriages as unions, that was the term that was used. And it was used particularly where the government draws a particular interest in that particular relationship. For instance, for tax purposes or for the benefit of children, for maintenance, uh, for many other things that were found all over all kinds of legislation. But what is also important is that in 1927, um, previously what had happened was that the colonialists had um, uh, sort of uh, abolished the practice of Lobolo and uh, in 1927, it was then legalized again, but marriages were not. Um, so that created a problem for people because they knew that their customary marriages were, were not legal. Um, so what they did was to celebrate, uh, as Dr. Mazibuka had indicated, marriages in terms of custom, and then they would then register those marriages as civil marriages. So there was no big problem as to which one is legal because it was very clear that only a civil marriage would be recognized by, by law. But there was another problem which I need to indicate. And this um, just sort of gives you a background of what we are going to discuss. There was another problem. Um, there was apartheid uh, from 1948, uh, which 
essentially meant that men were being used in big cities for labor, cheap labor, and the laws were in such a way that uh, people would not be able to get leave, for instance, so they had to spend a lot of time in hostels, which were specifically created for the labor force uh, in big cities. And uh, you'll recall that uh, these men would have left their wives in homelands, uh, former homelands and in rural areas because no black person would uh, be allowed in South Africa unless you had a permit. So that separated families. So you'd have men living elsewhere and wives living elsewhere. And the time to meet was really very, very much limited. And that, that was because all because of apartheid. But essentially, that those were, were, were the issues at the time. In 2000, uh, when the Recognition of Customary Marriages Act gave full recognition to customary marriages, um, that law, like any other law, is subject to the Bill of Rights. So it could not have been passed unless it actually uh, complies with the Bill of Rights. But that created another problem because now, if you look at the definition of customary law, you'd see that the main component of it is that it's created by practice. It's not um, uh, actually enacted by legislatures. So um, when the legislature now comes along and passes law and say, this is the custom now that you need to follow, people are not necessarily going to follow that particular custom because it's foreign to them. So those are the kinds of issues that create uh, uncertainty in law currently. And, um, and of course, it really raises another question relating to the rights of women. I think Professor Gubani highlighted that particular aspect earlier on. So that is just a little bit of background information. But the other thing that I need to do very, very quickly, I must say, uh, for the benefit of those who are not uh, familiar with African family systems, is just to briefly outline it uh, quickly before I go into the discussion regarding the consequences. Now, um, African, when, when Africans say family, they actually mean a lot more than husband and wife and the children. Um, it's actually a lot more than that. In a sense, um, you'd, you had um, Dr. Mazibuko also highlighting the relevance of religion in African customs. Although customary law is not essentially based on religion, it is highly influenced by religion. So ancestors are right at the top of the pyramid, if you want, uh, you know, you'd like to say, they, they are considered to be part of family, despite the fact that they are already gone. Because Africans believe that, you know, uh, you, you, your spirit lives forever. So you need to feed it, you need to talk to it, you need to go and visit it. So um, that is the, at the top of the pyramid. But another thing that you need to take into account is what is known as a family head, because in the past, the courts have said family heads are husbands. Um, a family head can be any party who's entitled to hold that position. So it can be a, a, an elder in the family who's considered to be a family head. It can also be a husband in the family who is considered a family head. In some communities, you uh, even find women uh, who are actually family heads. So the idea behind this pyramid is just to show the importance of family or extended family, because the law, the way in which customary law is designed is to protect the interests of the entire group. So whatever rights the individual um, may have within the group, that had to be uh, sort of in compliance with rules relating to the interests of the group. So that would be explained a little bit further when you look at the consequences of a customary marriage. Now, you've had uh, the previous speakers talking about various aspects of how a marriage, marriage is celebrated. Uh, there was reference to many things, but I'm showing you this picture because I want you to think about it um, um, later on when I um, discuss this aspect. Now, Dr. Mazibuko talked about a crawl. You can see it here in the middle of the estate. And then you can see the gate there. 
and then you can see that some of the houses are on the right, some uh, houses are on the left uh, in, in terms of where the, the gate is, and the, the crawl is in the middle. So this is just kind of an ancient um, way of living. People don't no longer live like this nowadays. Some, some, some still do, but that has a particular significance. That particular architecture on its own says a lot about the family. So one would look at the houses and can tell that it's actually a large family. And one can also tell by position of the houses who's, who, who you know, in terms of the, 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 the status of the wives, the, if there are many of them, uh, what is their actually status or rank within the family? You can just tell by looking at the houses. That would require a discussion on its own. So I'm not going to go for any further on that topic. Uh, of course, this is very ancient. Um, one would have hoped that the law would have developed the same way that architecture has de developed nowadays. Um, this is one picture where one would say, well, if it was not for colonialism, perhaps this is how Africa would have looked like or modern Africa would have looked like. But you can see the similarities from what I have uh, shown you previously. And you can see there another example. Um, uh, so, but remember again, uh, people live in cities. So customary law, the application of customary law actually doesn't, is not limited to rural areas. It does extend to the big cities. And of course, um, there are many issues there. You could see the architecture is actually different. Now, if you're talking about a family with many wives, then you can wonder how that is actually determined in terms of living arrangements. But um, it's a topic for another day. Let me just start by just defining certain things that would um, be referred to in legislation, which may confuse people. Um, when you looked at um, the picture that I showed you previously, you saw that I said these are the houses and you saw the structures that you actually see in the picture now. Now, in terms of legislation, um, a house you have, is- You have five minutes left five now. Five minutes. Yes, okay, ma all right. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I just want to deal with a, the definition of a house. A, a, a house in customary law is defined as be more than just that structure. It is a family. It also concerns the rights of, of that particular family. So in customary law, one has to distinguish between a house and a family. And when you're talking about a house, you could be talking about the structure or the woman in that house who's a wife of the husband and the, the children in that house. So uh, a family home, of course, would be the entire estate. It's called a family home. So you'll see that in the, in the section that I'm going to refer to in a moment. I have to jump all this and just look at the section. Now, let me start with this one here. It says, section 7.6 of the Recognition of Customary Marriages Act says, a husband in a customary marriage who wishes to enter into a further customary marriage with another woman, after the commencement of this act, he must then make that application to the court for the court to approve an antinuptial contract that will regulate the propriety system of his polygamous marriages. The problem with this is that men don't do it. So they don't get that approval from court and they still marry many women. So the question then becomes, how do you deal with the separation uh, at the time of divorce, the separation of the estate or the division of the estate? So you can see this section deals with only marriages after the act was enacted in 2000. So let's uh, look at that quickly. And uh, we can then um, um, have a discussion. Now, there is one thing that I need to mention. The Recognition of Customary Marriages Act recognizes all customary marriages, including the marriages that were concluded before it was enacted. So the, the court had to deal with a, a big question as to how the estate is divided. If a marriage that was concluded before 2000, before the act was enacted, how that has to be divided. 
And you find the answer in that case of Ramuhovi, which essentially um, is very, I think it's very uh, clear, but in practice, very, very confusing. It says husbands and wives will have a joint and equal ownership and other rights to the family property uh, or the marital property. So that's, that's what I wanted to clarify when I, was, I wanted to define the house and, 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 and family. But nevertheless, it continues. It says, in respect of house property, um, that those assets are owned both by the husband and the wife of that house jointly and in the best interests of the family. Now, so the husband would own 50% in a particular house together with the other 50% owned by the wife of that house. When it comes to family property, then the husband, you can see Roman two, uh, figure two there, uh, it's owned by the husband and all the wives jointly and in the best interest of the whole family. Now, if you want to deal with the, this particular aspect at the time of divorce or death of a spouse, you, you have a problem because um, first, um, land that the estate is situated in rural areas particularly would not be owned by these parties. It would be um, you know, communal land. So you can't actually do anything about ownership of that land. So what remains then is how do you deal with the houses? Um, and you, you saw in that picture, the, the way in which the architecture appears uh, makes it impossible to actually divide it. And then perhaps one would think also, if you're talking about a family property, what is it exactly that you are talking about? So that still is a, one problem that has to be uh, clarified by the courts. Um, let's look at another example, um, which I think um, many people would, would, would be concerned about this. Now, if the marriage was entered into after December 2000, which is uh, after the act was enacted, then the case of uh, MM versus MN says that if the husband failed to apply successfully to court for approval of an antinatural contract, then the first marriage to his first wife, the matrimonial property would continue as it was entered into. But with all subsequent marriages to additional women, their marriages would be out of community of property. Now, if you think about this, uh, compare it to what I said earlier, if the marriage was before 2000, then everyone seems to be included. All wives would, would seem to benefit from um, the separation of the estate. However, if the marriage was entered into after 2000, then there's a problem because all those wives who were married after the first wife would be married out of community of property as a result of the unilateral action on the part of the husband. Now, remember that section says the husband must make that application to court. So none of the wives is, is actually required to make that application. And uh, so it has to be made by the husband. If he didn't do it and continue to marry wives, those wives would be considered to be married out of community of property. So um, this, I think is becoming a big issue. There's just one thing, Professor Gubani, that I would like to deal with uh, that perhaps you would want to hear as well. I'm going to omit some of the things here. All right, another concern concerning the consequences of a customary marriage is in relation to another legislation which was enacted in 2009, where um, you can see um, these two sections here, um, where the definition of a descendant, if a husband died interstate without a will, the definition of a descendant now in terms of legislation that is applicable to interstate succession has changed. And it includes a woman who is not a spouse of that deceased man, but 
a woman who had entered into a union with that man for the purpose of providing him with children. So this is problematic because a union is not a valid marriage. And in terms of customary law, there is no way that one can say there is a union. You can only talk about a marriage. Yet you will see this section saying a union in accordance with customary law. Um, so that creates a problem currently. Uh, and, and you'll see a, a lot of cases that go to court with this problem, uh, trying to address the problem. Uh, the problem is anybody, because the man is deceased now, anybody who has a child with the man would say, well, I, I, you know, I had a union with him, so I'm entitled to, to be a descendant. Now, you will see another um, section there, section three, and it says there, for the purposes of this act, uh, a spouse who survived the deceased man must be construed as including not only his spouse, the wife that he's married to, but every woman that is referred to in section two above. So at the time of his death, really, when he dies, he would become a polygamist at the time of death. So if he was mon married, mon married monogamously to one woman, um, when he dies, this other woman is considered to be a wife under section three. And she's not only a wife, she's actually uh, also a Fuka. descendant. Okay, Fuka Professor Fuka. Mubane, I will stop there. Okay. Thank you so much yeah. Thank for the you opportunity. Very much. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry that I had to stop you, but in terms of time, we have, uh, we've been very generous to you. I gave you more than the other panelists, but thank you very much for your presentation. I didn't realize that the customary marriages was also as complicated as the other, the civil one. But uh, it, it brings us to the end of the presentation. Now we'll allow uh, the discussion and question session, which is now going to be 25 minutes. I've got the first question here uh, from Wanda Cyril. He's, he says, so it sounds like in Islam, a man can only marry widows and is it for orphans protection? So if there is no threat of any kind, like in case where a late husband left enough security and I live in a safe country without much threat, is it another man then allowed to marry that uh, widow? Can Munar uh, respond to that quickly and briefly? We have only 25 minutes now. I thank you for the question, Wanda. Uh, basically, when I spoke about that, I was giving the context in which that particular verse was revealed. And so, of course, that, that particular condition doesn't exist now. So that doesn't mean to say that if you marry two, three, or four, they have to be widows. But according to some uh, jurisdictions, there has to be a reason why you're taking on. Now, remember, I also spoke about the fact that there are justifications for this particular uh, practice. And one of them is that if the first wife can't have children, etc. of course, there's no guarantee that the second, third or fourth uh, is going to have um, uh, children, but uh, those are some of the conditions. So uh, that specific condition doesn't exist anymore, but it was more to contextualize why that particular verse came down in the way it did. So yes, so if there's a very, very wealthy uh, widow and she does not want uh, to marry, she has that choice. I mean, in marriage, she can give a consent if she wants to marry and if she doesn't want to marry, uh, she is free to be able to do that. So there's nothing uh, putting any kind of pressure on this wealthy widow that she must uh, get married because that is what is expected of her in order for her to continue uh, that. Remember that a marriage is not only for financial uh, security, etc. There's various uh, different uh, purposes why people marry. So thank you for that question. Yeah, thank you for responding so uh, uh, articulately. Can we give you the next question? If a widow gets married a second husband who is not the father of the children, then the pro problem will, on the part of the orphans will continue. 
the new father will never replace the real father. What, what's your comment on that? Well, that's true in any situation for that matter, whether it's a father or a mother, you cannot replace uh, the biological uh, father. In fact, you could have an instance where uh, the new father is perhaps better than uh, the biological father uh, in that particular instance. So there would always be that particular kind of tension uh, where there is a non-biological father that is now taking over that role. However, the reasoning behind that is, uh, is more to be, when we're talking about uh, children here, they still need a lot of guidance in various different aspects of their life. They need financial assistance, etc., And that is more the reason why this idea uh, uh, was given a uh, route to in that particular way and in that context. No, thank you very much. The next question is directed to Baba Mfuking. Uh, this is in with regards to Unified Marriage Act, do you think this proposed act will be inclusive, religious, civil, and African customary marriages, or should we expect delays in, in its implementation? And Dr. Mfukeng. Well, it's, it's a single marriage uh, uh, act, so it's, it's, it's supposed to cover all kinds of marriages in, in South Africa, but the, um, the, the problem I think is with implementation because like I said uh, in my presentation, customary law is not only what you see in the act, it's also, it extends to what is in the social practices. So uh, there might be um, a lot of uh, confusion as to some of the provisions of the act. If we had time, we would have looked at those, but I believe that um, it can be implemented, but it will similarly lead to a lot of um, uh, litigation and chaos. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Seabong Aspisi has another question. Have the reasons that prevented the Muslim marriage bill from being passed subsided? Uh, Munira, this is your question. Okay, thank you, Sia. I was reading your question and I was thinking, well, what? which particular reason you were referring to, because there was a whole host of factors uh, why that particular bill did not go through. But I think one of the main reasons is that people see the disunity or the fragmentation amongst the Muslim community itself as one of the biggest challenges for the bill actually not being passed. Uh, and if that is the question, and we're thinking about whether that persists with regard to the single marriage statute, then that particular segment that was vehemently opposed to the Muslim Marriages Bill is not vehemently opposed to this particular single marriages bill purely because it is not being passed in the name of Islamic law. And so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. So uh, they would obviously support the, 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 the single marriage statute in that respect. However, the single marriage statute, if I may just add some comment on the single marriage statute, um, I think that was one of your questions as well, is not really all that inclusive of religious or cultural marriages, et cetera, because you think about it, it, it's treating everybody in the same way, which is very much a sort of formal equality approach uh, to all of these marriages, whereas there are lots of differences in the way certain things are done. Uh, one very, very good example is in, while Islamic law and perhaps other religious religions permit uh, uh, divorce. If you look at uh, Hindu, the Hindu legal system, there's a huge debate about whether divorce is permitted or not. So just those two systems, and those are some of the prevalent religious systems in South Africa itself, uh, shows how you cannot cheat all of them, uh, you know, in one rush stroke. I, I, personally, I think this particular bills are going to have huge challenges in being uh, part. Oh, thank you. I think Brenda's question is referred to you, Munira, about the unfairness. Add that one. Munira. Yes, I remember reading that question, Brenda, basically saying that if one of the wives uh, experienced some kind of uh, uh, poor treatment from the husband, then what sort of recourse do they have? Well, currently yes. they don't have any recourse because uh, 
there is which forum do they actually take their complaint to? You know, even if they do take it to the existing uh, theological bodies, those theological bodies operate in a strange way that is very partial to the men. So they're not really going to get uh, anything out of that. But if this was regulated through some kind of statutory framework, and then the matter could be raised in court. So uh, if it was an issue around uh, maintenance, then in terms of uh, doing justice, maintenance would mean that they would have to be all maintained uh, in an equitable fashion, etc. Then there would be some recourse for the woman in that particular position. All right, thank you. Seabong uh, asked Dr. Masbu, is payment of Ilobolo mandatory? Is it possible to have a customary marriage without Lobolo? Um, if, if Lobolo is, is important uh, and it form an integral part of uh, bringing two families together and sealing uh, the, the relationship. However, uh, it must be well uh, managed because uh, we all know that now it has been uh, commercialized and uh, people are demanding more, more than what it used to be. But if we go back uh, in earlier times and where it started, uh, the, 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 the main purpose was to bring families together. And it's not Ilobolo only. Because after Ilobolo, there is the giving of the gifts from the bride to be to the to to the groom to be family. So there's quite a lot of activities, giving of gifts from both families and uh, to strengthen the relations. Thank In you. In short, yes, if it is well managed, yes, it, it, it must continue. It has to. So is it mandatory that you, you pay Ilobolo? Yes, you have to pay Ilobolo, especially in the, uh, in the customary marriage, because during the day of uh, Umtato, the, 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 the Inkosi representative must, must confirm that Ilobolo has been paid and also uh, must also tell the, 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 the people that uh, what was it that was paid and uh, were the families satisfied with that or not? So yes, it is. Okay. The, the, the next question is on Pauline, polyandry. Whose culture is that or whose religion is that? I, I, I don't, any panelists can respond to that one. The government is uh, proposing to introduce uh, that uh, polyandry, where a, a woman can have as many husbands as she wants. I can try. Um, Please go ahead. I, yeah, uh, there isn't really a huge community or religious grouping that is actually practicing polyandry. From my understanding in the debates that has been going around uh, and the discussions on the single marriage statute, uh, the push for polyandry is coming from the gender activists and uh, uh, that particular grouping uh, where it's looking at uh, polygyny in terms of a very, very kind of formal equality uh, equation. Where if you're treating men and you're allowing men to have more than one wife, then surely women must have more than one husband. That's, that's just my understanding. But uh, in terms of the question, uh, I can understand that is there a particular group that we need to satisfy then um, it's really, uh, I, don't, I don't even, I can't even say that it's that much of a percentage in the community that's actually practicing polyandry. I've yet to find a woman who's brave enough to have more than one husband, but anyway. Okay, thank, thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm afraid, uh, Munira, the next question from Sibusi Siwanjela is also directed to you. It's a long one. Okay. Yeah, I, I've, I've read the question. Basically, uh, you're correct, but even in the current setup, in order for the vulnerable groupings, which is women and children in this particular respect, for them to access any benefits or claim any rights, are having to approach the courts in any event. If there's a statute, then 
a statute is going to govern many, many of these issues and challenges that they face on the ground. So if there's a regulatory framework, then not everything has to be brought before the court in the form. So yes, access to courts is an expensive uh, uh, um, exercise. But I think that what the, uh, the Muslim Marriages Bill was trying to achieve was to put the vulnerable women and children in a better position in terms of how they can claim their rights uh, uh, in this particular situation. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, Kulegani has just made a, a, a statement, but there is a question from Sibusisi and Leila directed to Dr. Mazibu. Just wanted to know if your exposition of Zulu custom represent official or living customary law. I'm sure Dr. Masbo has read that question. Sorry, Chair, can you come again with the question? I just wanted to know if your exposition of Zulu custom presents official or living customary law. I ask specifically because there is a precedent of the SCA that essentially provides that a customary law marriage can be constituted by the payment of Ilobol. This is clearly very different from what a lot of Zulu persons believe and practice. Yes, Chair, I yes. Can, can you help me in that one? Oh, I did. Okay. Let me check, go through it uh, once more. <laughs> Exposition of Zulu custom presents official or living customary law. <laughs> yes, I think it, 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 it is very important, as Dr. Masbu has alluded to uh, before, that the payment of Ilobolo is very e e e e mandatory. So this is not different from a lot of Zulu person believe and practice because the, the Zulu nation is one nation and the, 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 the belief is that you cannot have a wife without paying Ilobolo. And it's not only the payment per se, Ilobolo is the union bringing two families together in a contract. And it involves the ancestors as uh, Mr. Mfukeng has explained, it's not just the families, but it involves those who are living and those that are, are dead. So it can only be constituted uh, once a lobola is, is paid. Even if you undertake uh, to uh, opt for a civil uh, a wedding, the, the, the marriage officer will ask if Lobola has been paid or not. And if the Lobola uh, has not been paid, th 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 that wedding will not proceed. I hope I, I've, I, I've done justice to that question. The next one from Kulega, and however, the family structure has undergone significant changes over the years. Does that not warrant an, a need for revision of customs in customary law in light of today's family structure. So we live in modernity. Do we have to revisit our customs and in the customary law? I think uh, Mr. Mfuken can assist us in this uh, question. Oh yes, um, just, um, just two things. I, I, I think uh, uh, the, there was a question about a living, living customary law and whether the uh, people still do things today that they did in the past. Um, it's a tricky question and it's, it, it connects directly to the one that you just um, asked me now, because um, customary law on its own is changing every day because the way in which it, it has been interpreted by the courts is that it is, it is a changing system and it very much depends on what people do uh, at a particular time in history. And uh, if they do that long enough, then it becomes customary. That's, the, that's what the courts have said. But I'll just make an example. Um, of course, um, many years ago, people would uh, deliver 
cattle as, as, as a property for Lobola. And uh, you would not expect anybody to bring cash. So nowadays people bring cash and that has sort of become customary. So it's now acceptable. So um, the problem is that there is no uh, linkage between what legislation says and what people actually do. So that is the main problem that uh, I think people are facing now because there may be rights in terms of law, but people don't actually observe those rights. They may be uh, duties, but people don't actually do those things. So yes, it requires a review and that review has to be done by the communities themselves to have a proper system of customary law uh, instead of uh, 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 you know, legislation very formal. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ngubani, Professor Ngubani. Oh, thank you very much. I've got one question from Professor Dango. It's a quick one uh, directed to Dr. Masbo. Does Ilobola prevent people from getting married? Uh, che, yes, it does uh, uh, nowadays because uh, it is now commercialized and uh, people, they, 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 they ask for higher uh, amount of money. Uh, but however, it was not uh, the way it was supposed to be because it was forming uh, good relations between the two families. But now because uh, people have to pay like 80,000 because it is commercialized. Uh, but um, yeah, it's not supposed to be like that because the yeah, aim is to, yeah. It also encourages young men to work for their uh, uh, wives to be. Thank you very much, Dr. Masbu. Olusegan asks, why is most Islamic uh, scholar are quoting Quran out of content by simply saying Islam allows four or more wives, but failing to explain uh, to would be couple the strict condition attached to it? Uh, Mun Munara. Oh. Well, I'm not sure where that comes from because maybe I should just clarify that I don't know of any scholars that say that you can take on more than four wives because the verse in the Quran is very clear that you can only take on up to four wives. So whether that is a wife that everybody knows about or if that wife is a hidden wife, but the point is at any given time, a Muslim man can only take up to four wives at the current time. So uh, yes, there is a... a need for education around uh, the uh, issues of uh, regulating polygynous marriages. And so there needs to be a lot of education. Even women themselves sometimes are not very clear on what their rights are uh, with regard to polygynous marriages, etc. So, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. If only three uh, questions remaining, uh, Norma. Uh, can you please bear with us? I I'm sure this will be uh, two to three minutes. Pumelelo uh, Zigalala ask what would constitute a divorce in Zulu customary marriage, especially in cases where the couple hasn't lived as husband and wife for years. Can it be concluded that we have divorced by simply not living together or doing things together as husband and wife? This is directed to Dr. Masbo. And Patrick Kikini, will the issue of no divorce, according to Umtaiko, be in line with the Bill of Rights? Those two questions are directed to Dr. Mazbu. And the last one is also directed to Dr. Mazbu. Who pays the lobola when a woman uh, marries a second husband? Can you just summarize the three questions in one uh, response? Uh, uh, we, uh, the first question, uh, maybe I can join uh, the first and second question, uh, uh, going back to the conclusion that I made, that uh, there is no divorce in, uh, in, Isizulu, in, in Zulu culture, there is no divorce in Zulu wedding because uh, of the, the, the the, 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 the sealing of all the, the, the ceremonies and the customs uh, that accompany the, the, the marriage, because there is no buy 
that can take away the bile that was sprinkled to the bride. So uh, I cannot answer a question based on uh, the, 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 the issue of divorce because in Zulu culture, in Zulu wedding, there is no divorce. Yeah, let me respond, thank you. Let me respond quickly to Temba Mbongo. Uh, the question, who pays the lobola when a woman marries a second husband? The second husband pays the lobola because uh, he is uh, marrying that woman. But uh, if the woman has got children, then there is a discounted lobola. We know that uh, uh, some say who prescribed 11 uh, cows for, 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 for a woman. But if the, the woman has got children, then it depends on the number of children. Then there is a discount when a second uh, husband wants to get married. So the second husband pay a lobola. Uh, I'm afraid uh, I cannot take uh, the, but I'm guided by you, Norma, if I can, still take the, 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 the last two questions that have just come through. Professor Ngubane, Norma is having network uh, issues, so she's oh. not on. So you will do the closing remarks as well, please. Oh, okay. All right. Let's, let, let's then take this uh, question from Liz. The conundrum appears to be not custom, but an ad hoc relationship. There needs to be protection of women and children Hence, attempt in earlier legislation to require men to register a second marriage with the court. Custom cannot be created at ad hoc. The law can only recognize historic custom and practice. Liz Perry, social anthropology. Uh, Mr. Mfuken, can you help us with this one? Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gubani. Um, that, that is the problem. The, the problem is that if, if custom is changed through legislation, um, it, it is no longer custom. So uh, one would still like to call it customary law, but I believe that now uh, that it's in the form of legislation, it's, it's no longer customary law. So I think most speakers try to find that link between what they see in the form of legislation and what actually communities do. And they cannot find that link. And then therefore it becomes, you know, it becomes very, very complicated. But um, it's, it's, it's all about what the legislation is doing and which does not filter down to the people or people don't actually accept what the legislature uh, has done. So that's, that's the problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, with, uh, due to time constraints, I don't think we can take uh, more questions, but there's this last one. Does customary law set limitation on how many times does one person referring to a woman has to be paid lobola in cases where a woman has been widowed several times? Do you want to quickly respond to that one, uh, uh, Dr. Masbu? Okay, I think uh, we've lost Dr. Mazibogo, but I don't think there, there is any stipulation uh, uh, with regards to that in the customary law. It depends on the families and the responsible person, uh, but th there is no limitation as to how many uh, times the lobola must be paid. As I said, the lobola depends on whether you have ch you, you had children or not. Uh, on that note, uh, colleagues, uh, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have come to the end of our mm -hmm. webinar today. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Shaki Shakila and the corporate relations uh, team, uh, Norma in particular for arranging this webinar. I think this was an insightful uh, uh, webinar and the topic was relevant and I do 
I appreciate the presentations from the panelists, although they were shortcoming in terms of time limitation, but I think we have done justice to the topic and I hope uh, then maybe next time we'll have more time uh, to focus on one aspect. I, I realized that um, the, the last presentation by Mr. Fuking was too technical and it needed more time, but we, we do appreciate that you did justice to, to your presentation. Thank you very much for all the participants who took their time off to be with us on this webinar. And uh, I think we have all enjoyed the, the discussion today. On that note, this, this webinar is therefore adjourned. Bye-bye. <laughs>